Thank you for listening today on Revealing Wholeness, sponsored by Infinity Whole Health. Check out our website at infinitywholehealth.com, where we are revealing the eternal in each individual, the infinite in the individual. The creativity is made manifest. Limitation is let go. Now, here's your host, Dr. Troy Munson. Hello and welcome. I'm Dr. Troy Munson. Today, we have a special podcast and I have a guest in the the studio today. And this is someone that I have known for, for many, many years and has helped me as a business person has also helped many, many other people uh, just really develop businesses. And I consider her to be really mentally tough. We were having a conversation the other day and we thought, you know what, this would be an awesome topic to just bat back and forth and and get really down to earth on what does mental toughness really look like. And so this being April of 2024, and this is our stress month, how do we begin to deal with stress, but otherwise having mental toughness? So in the studio is Candace. Thank you so much for for coming and playing. Oh, I love that. Thank you so much for having me. It is awesome. So Candace, if I can, this is, most people know me if they've listened to my podcast long enough, they've known where I come from, the difficulties in my life that I've I've overcome and got to the point where I am now. But let's let's explore your life for just a moment so people can kind of figure out, hey, who is this who is this Candace and what she's made of and where did you come from and what have you been through? What what gives you a, a voice to speak, so to speak? Well, thank you. I again I'm, I appreciate the opportunity. Um, you know, I believe that a lot of this goes up to everywhere, I mean, like say uh, how we're raised mm-hmm. all the way uh, through our life. And I don't think we're ever uh, not lifting barbells, shall I say, <laughs> for mine. Yeah. Um, my parents used to buy dying businesses. Mm-hmm. And so because of that, we were always in the business. Mm-hmm. And so let me define this. When I'm four years old, okay, at the deli, I can tell you, how many slices of pizza do we need to sell for lunch to pay for Rita? How many slices of roast beef? How many loaves sure. of bread? I mean, we could do all of that because we were always in business. Yeah. I don't ever remember a time of not work. Sure. And so when you think about that, as a child, my summers were never spent playing and discovering as normal children. I am always on. I'm always uh, problem solving. Yeah. We did the, uh, fairs. They landed, they decided they wanted to do fairs. And so my dad worked for the Tacoma police department, which gave us, uh, he was the range master, which gave the family stability financially. And so we did, uh, Cane's apple dumplings, gang and things. And we handmade apple dumplings from scratch. And so we did every festival. Uh, we did every, we did every fair we could land into. And that's what my summers started a month before school got out. And we ended at the Yakima Fair, which was about a month or two after school started. So it was nonstop almost every weekend. It was literally nonstop. Yeah. And so where do you go as a child? You're already being taught to be an adult when you're, you know, four years old, five years old, six years old. So as you progress at some point, Mm -hmm. my challenge really didn't hit me until I got into junior high school Yeah, because I'm always working. And so now you're old enough. They had landed the um, contract for the Pierce County Parks and Recreation. So I actually managed Lake Taps Marina when I was 13, 14, and 15. I was responsible for the gas dock and everything, the employees that were up there. When you're that young, it seems weird at some point. I mean, I'm sorry, school, I'm already making money. Yeah. And I'm solving problems. And in my mind, I'm already in my 20s or 30s. What are you going to teach me in junior high that I haven't already learned? Unfortunately, that was kind of my attitude. (laughs) Not a good place. But um, respectfully, what really, it became a place for me to have a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to be there. And I surely didn't want a teacher telling me what to do. So that created different problem solving skills, which I think all of us go through to a degree, we want to start flexing muscles in a different way. 
And a lot of times there isn't societal norms, family norms. Um, if you're part of a collective, uh, whether it be a religious organization or a club, yeah. you have what there are normalities within that that are acceptable. Yes. And s- part of that, I feel that um, just a, a, a bit is that you start lifting those barbells, understanding, okay, if I act a certain way, it's not acceptable with this group. Sure. If I act this way with this group. So you start problem solving and figuring out what you can do and what you can't do for societal norms. Yeah. And I think that understanding from the very beginning, it'd be like, Troy, when did you realize that you needed to, let's say, think out, think a problem different or see the world brighter or greener or what was your mental aha mo- moment that said, okay, I got to come back and re- kind of redefine these things and yeah. start lifting some weights. We might not have said lifting weights. Sure. We might have said, wow, okay, Johnny called me, you know, stupid and I can either believe it or not. Yeah. Right. It's very, that it starts that simply. Sure. And, and I even look back and I think, gosh, when did that happen? When, when was that? And I think I could say I grew up pretty happy. My life was pretty good. But as I only lived like in my head, things began to spiral down. And by the time I was 24, 25, 26, I I mean, I was quite a miserable person. And I think it finally hit rock bottom in about about 28 years of age. And then I realized something, something had to change. So I would like to say that I was really smart and I did it sooner than I should have. But ultimately it is, you, you have to reach your own dark place oftentimes in order to change and have the motivation to go somewhere new and begin to think this is not okay what I'm doing. And that's when I, I basically let go. And I learned at about age 30 that I was the result of most of my issues. And I think at that point, it then was the, the most, the heavy lifting part of it was now surmounting the habits that were in place of this negativity, mm-hmm. just constantly driving back to it. And so here you have this own experience at junior high, just respect wise, you know, having very little for school and what have you, when, you know, if mine was around 2830, when was yours? I don't, um, I know you made me speechless. Um, I honestly think that mine was probably much younger. I, I realized actually when I was three, I can tell you when fear entered me Yeah, was when I was three, I, I was disobedient. Mm-hmm. My dad told me to not do something. I, uh, they were slaughtering bunnies. For food. Okay. I got up on the chair because I was curious. And um, I saw what they were doing. So he ran up the stairs. He grabbed me. um, And he had violently grabbed my arm and swung me through the kitchen uh, to the point that it it wasn't a good place to be. Sure. And I remembered at that moment, one, I'd never known fear until that moment. The second thing that I realized is I better figure this out mm. because this isn't what I ever want. Yeah. And so if I was to actually put a point where I realized it would probably be in that moment that I had better figure it out because I didn't I had been figuring it out ever since. Yeah. And so epiphanies along the way for mental toughness, when do you feel like the first one hit you or when something changed or shifted in your mind, do you have, do you have a time frame when that may have happened? I know for myself, it was at age nine. That was when my first realization or at least understanding that, that I had at least some different things that I could choose where a choice actually became an option. I don't know when that was for you, if something comes to mind. This is, um, I really did not feel that I had much of a choice in quite a few areas of Mm. my life. And I did not realize I could find my voice, Mm. um, probably not until my forties. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
and you know, so for me, it was, it was an injury that happened at age nine. And then I realized when somebody helped me that there was, there was this, this choice and there was this ability to now do something different. But then it's weird because I remember now expanding that choice and asking many questions, but then it seemed like at age 12, 13, it kind of got quashed. It kind of sounds like maybe similar to you when junior high, I don't know if it was quashed or shoved down, but I remember it almost kind of going dormant. The That voice for choice wasn't there anymore. And then it was all of these things that just felt kind of the tide of life. I would tell people, I remember telling people when I was oh, 20, 21, I said, hey, if I could sell my brain, I could just say, hey, barely used at that point. And it <laughs> was true. Funny. It That's was true. funny, though. Because that should be on a t-shirt. <laughs> it should have, should have been. But then when I started actually using it and realizing it was a tool and not something just to direct me all the time and that I was just caught up in its little shenanigans, that was a complete change in shift of, of who is the operator and who is being operated. And it was really wild. Like, I just thought that the brain was controlling me. And then when all of a sudden it, the roles got reversed and I realized there was this, there was this presence that was me. And then the brain had its thoughts and ideas, but they weren't mine. Mm -hmm. And, and then that shift of now operating the brain rather than being operated was, was very different. And so the body, I'm just going to include that in the brain because it's kind of a, a package deal. But that presence that is behind all of that, when, when you still thoughts and you still your mind and everything goes away and you're just hyper present, you then have that idea of, hey, this is a completely different aspect of what I thought I was. Sure. And so that's, that's one of the epiphany awakenings, I think, when I was probably 29 in 1999. That would be, you know, a huge awakening for me at that point. And so you talk about 40s. Can you mm -hmm. let us in on that? What what was going on? I was completely frustrated with my career. Mm. Best thing in my life that I had going really was my marriage. Mm -hmm. Marriage has always been strong. What uh, I was done. I was done with corporate America. Done with all the contracts. Just you know, just done with. With all of the uh, stress that, you know, you get on that, that race, you're that, you know, that rat, that rat race, you, you get in that hamster wheel and you run and you run and you run. And I ran until I hit the wall of just sheer exhaustion, brokenness, sure. realizing that I've poured myself out for years on mm -hmm. uh, never knowing that. Um, I probably should pro you know, be feeding more in than out, which I think if you're a real caregiver that naturally, whether you're male or female, that you do that because it's a subconscious thing. It's a, it's the giver in you naturally. Sure. So you pour yourself out and I had taken on, I decided I wanted to do more training mm -hmm. and which I always love, um, you know, big advocate of constantly learning. And when I was doing this incredible uh, training for different aspects of coaching people, yeah. because I'd already been coaching people for years, and I had wanted to go deeper into what I was already experiencing myself with others. And so when I took that rabbit trail, it literally, for me, it opened up another world because I finally had individuals asking different questions, hmm. Troy, for the first time. Explain, like what? Going from what to what? So, okay, even simple conversations. I had people that started, that I felt actually saw me. Mm, yeah. And instead of, no, you can't, instead of crab pot mentality, for the first time, being utterly submerged in a community of, yes, you can, mm. on anything. Yeah. I want to run for president. Yes, you can. We'll get behind you. Mm. I want to go on to the Oprah show. Yes, you can. I want to climb Mount Everest. Yes, you can. I mean, no, there was, there's no idea without, yes, you can. Sure. And I, I realized 
a part of the awakening Mm -hmm. that was, and it's heartbreaking Mm -hmm. because when you realize that you've been held back by individuals that you love, that you have um, entrusted, right? Sure. Because opinions do matter when you're looking for them. Yes. And you're trying to seek out different roads in which valleys you want to avoid or mountaintops that you definitely want to hit in life. You know? Sure. So we go to those people. Um, it was sad because I'd realized that I had been held back by religious people that I had entrusted. Sure. Uh, family members, friends, colleagues. Mm-hmm. Well meaning, by the way. Yes. Thank yes. you. Because you're absolutely right. Yeah. Well meaning. Yeah. You know, and I do mean bless their heart. Yes. You know? <laughs> but when you are suddenly, yes, you can. Yeah. And you're celebrate your the talents are celebrated instead of something that should be oh, you know, poo pooed or mm-hmm. put down or limited yeah. and manipulated yes. then all of a sudden you realize that the possibility right because god made me so cool and awesome it has nothing to do with me because he's the one that formed me made me yes. knit me you know even thought about me sure we're just being honest we're just being he did honest that. Yeah. <laughs> i just figured i'd jump off that's right <laughs> If that's what he wants to do, since we can't take any claim to it, yeah. my only job is to explore it, yeah. allow the talents to be freely, because they've been freely given, freely mm-hmm. used, yeah. not withhold, that we can be an incredible expression of love yeah. and that our scars aren't, aren't disfigurements, but actually the handiwork and the artistry of the master himself. True. I was chatting with a a client today and they're stuck in this old story and explaining, or at least having them go on a journey to see their story and then begin to realize that they indeed were the ones that made the choices to believe good or bad, whatever happened to them. And so we have, like we had chatted before, just briefly before we, we got on the mic here, is that yes, there there first seems to happen that life experience happens and the seemingly adversity that we label. And then from that adversity, as we both realize, is that all of a sudden there was this awareness. Something yes. something had changed, something was not quite right, something needed to change, or I'm not quite understanding what's really going on. And so here we now have this next stage in our development of mental toughness of being awareness. And then from that, that awareness, now we start getting some truth implanted in us. So now we're searching. So now we're, we're going through and reading. Who else has done this? Where else can I, I go that can help me through this, this process of doing it? And then we get into this, this possibility mindset that you had talked about. And now we realize that we're, we're more than knee deep on this journey towards mental toughness. And so most people that go through this process of becoming mentally tough are going to have similar experiences to this. So if you're out there listening to this, this is something that you shouldn't shy away from, but you should almost be not proud, but looking back at your roots and saying, this is what has formed me in this process to get to where I am now. And I'm not going to, to look back with condemnation, just as, as we look at God and God says, look, I made you this certain way. Nothing has changed since the moment I created you. If it is, then what I make is changeable, and that means I'm changeable, and may that never be so. And so as we get to that point of recognition, people say, well, that's quite arrogant that you think you're so amazing. No, it's simply being honest and living in reality of of understanding that God didn't make junk. He didn't make um, unrighteousness. He didn't make unholiness. He didn't make crap. He literally did it right the first time. It's only our thoughts about ourselves that are technically wrong, if we could even call that. Yes. And can we just, ex- may we explore that just yeah, for a absolutely. second? Yeah, absolutely. How many times before you realized, right, before, mm-hmm. and that you were, let's say, oh my gosh, Troy, you've got the most prettiest smile. Every time you smile, it just lights up the room. And the very first thoughts were, not really. 
or, you know, they're lying or they're just being nice. We, we diminish mm-hmm. the compliment, but if a true compliment is given, it's coming from a place of authenticity and love. Sure. And, and the, the short answer to that is when, when did I let go of pride? Cause pride would say that's not true. Pride, sure. pride would sure. also say that or puff me up and say, I look better than I do. And so it goes both directions, and it's really difficult for folks sometimes to see that because they don't feel prideful when they're self-deprecating. Right. But it is. It's, it's literally calling, saying, I know better than God. I, I am crappy, and I suck, or whatever. Or just as, as the opposite would be like, look at how amazing I am. Because I remembered playing sports, and every time that I would brag, I would ends, end up immediately falling flat on my face. No. Oh, no. You know, and, and, and losing whatever game that I was in. And I realized, ooh, pride, not good. <laughs> so I'm going to start remaining humble and just let my actions speak for themselves. And that was, that was a hard-won battle. And I probably didn't start really, really grasping that until probably eight or nine years into athletics, probably mid-20s. And I remember it coming full circle when somebody said, you are such a joy to play with because everybody you, everybody that does anything, you're just, you're just always saying, great job, good job. You're always complimenting and supporting everybody else, even though they might do the suckiest thing ever. And I thought, oh, how interesting. It's kind of full circle. I think I was 28 at the time when I had heard that comment the first time. And so things were starting to change, at least in that aspect. And maybe that's when I was ready to have this kind of epiphany or awakening, which is probably true. We're all digging down and tilling the soil until all of a sudden the root grows and now now something magnificent happens. But we think, well, it just happened. No, it was it was being dug into. I remember when I was being lorded as one of the best of when I had a management company that was helping helping me run my practice. And they were kind of touting me around as the poster child, so to speak. And everybody would come to me and ask me, well, how'd you do it? I said, well, I did what they said. But ultimately, for the last year, I've been writing my goals down three times a day. I've got pages and pages of things going. So I've been digging up the soil of this, trying to change what was going on in my life to, to allow the possibility to, to expand to do something different. And so everybody wants to see the end product and say, what did you do? But they don't see all the hard work. It's like Bill Gates, you know, we hear about he would 10 years on a computer grinding away until all of a sudden he created this company that just took off. Well... It just didn't happen. No. He put in his 10,000 hours, Absolutely. you know, so to speak. And that's, that's time and time again true for most. But Troy, what did you have to let go of mm. in order for something to come in? So yeah. my three questions are always, you know, what stays, what goes, and what do we bring in? Yeah. So what did you personally have to let go of for you to be able to expand? Wow. I mean, going back into that, I've never even thought about going back into those moments and saying, what, what did I have to let go of? And I suppose the first thing that comes to mind is this thought that what I'm getting right now must be right. And ultimately to reject that which what I thought I would, had to kind of stick with, that it didn't have to be that. And so we want, we want this opinion inside of us that I'm right. And I was, again, another client today, I said, they, they have somebody else in their life that's well-meaning, but they're telling them that everything they're doing is wrong. And I said, that's a person that's been made wrong over and over and over. And so they're literally making you wrong so that they can feel more right. And I do remember being in that situation where you just feel wrong all the time. But if it's weird to say that wrongness was obviously the way that it was, so it must be right. It must be correct. It must be what I am. And being able to turn my back on that first and saying that, that, isn't, that isn't true anymore. So rejecting those old belief systems that run can be difficult. And it's why we're, we're told that you have to pull the log out of your own eye. And of course, we look at our friend or our neighbor and we see a little speck in their eye and say, oh, you just got to let that go. Come on, it's easy. But it's not our crap. But when it's your That's own true. crap, try to let go of a piece of you. you know, That's find true. out how, how easy it is. No, it feels like a freaking log. 
And so that's why we're always supposed to work first about correcting ourselves. And it will seem like you are lifting something incredibly hard, incredibly heavy. But once you do it, you're like, oh, okay, well, this, I kind of of have momentum now. I kind of want to do this again and again. And so that, that momentum comes in where you're releasing a lot. Do you find yourself sometimes being like a spiritual junkie? Oh, yes. I've been through that stage. Reading everything and anything I could get my hands on that was of any ilk. And that's why I think sometimes people just need to be careful of what they what they lend their members. I can remember on my at times digging deeper into um, mm-hmm. and wanting stuff to be let go. So you're going in a spiritual vein. Sure. And um, uh, loving the desert or loving, you know, whatever you're going through because you knew, right, yeah. I'm going to get something on the other side and it's going to be really good. Sure. And then celebrating and couldn't wait to dove back in for some more. Yes. I have spent many a time on the mountaintop and then in the valley and, and those things that, that proverbially we do. And yeah, it, there's a time when you're just like, something's not right. And you just don't care at that point. You just, you're just going to start clinging to any truth you can find or supposed truth. And then once you, you dig down into those deeper level bedrock areas of your, of your own inner self, that is that peace, that, that joy, that love that's waiting for you in there. And then you can really start seeing what is true and what is not true. And I think that's, that's something that maybe not many people get to. But it is the adversity. So it just is another example. When, when I hire somebody, it is frequent that they'll cry in an interview. And they'll say, I, I can't believe I'm crying in an interview. And I said, if you didn't, I probably wouldn't hire you. Because you haven't faced enough pain and enough trauma and enough adversity to be worth a damn. And so when we get to that point, it actually tells me that I have a real human being here because I'm going to get into some very touchy-feely areas of their life when I interview them because I need to know what they're made of. And when we're, we're faced with that self, that idea of ourselves, and it's plain as day, it is breaking even in that because all of a sudden you see this is what I am and sometimes there's not so good stuff and sometimes there's great stuff there and I want to see it all it it doesn't matter to me whether they've judged it good or bad I just need to know what I'm dealing with because then now we know where we're at and where we're going so it can be really beneficial and I love leaving a person in a better state than when I found them especially an interview hey I know you're not right for our office but this is what you are, and this is who you are, and this is where you need to be looking for your next job because these are your strengths. And I'll have people come back and say, man, thank you so much for telling me that, that it, I love what I do now. I'm like, great, because we want you to succeed and be that round peg in the round hole or a square peg in a square hole or a star peg in a star hole. We don't want you to try to fit somewhere just because you need a job. We want you to fit somewhere because it's where you actually fit. And it's effortless for you. That's how all of life should be, but rarely is. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's because we're always trying to fit in where we really don't belong. Correct. And, you know, I mean, in business consulting, I mean, I've literally had business owners Hmm. that tell me. I mean, they're in a customer relationship business and they say, I hate people. Hmm. And I have looked at them and said, what in the hell is happening here? Why'd you do it? I mean, what, what what provoked you in the first place to want to have a a people centered business if you don't like people? I mean, you could do yeah. dogs, cats. You'd be. I mean, there's lots of other things you could be. Indeed. But it's very. It is fascinating. Why? Because I think sometimes, even in when we talk to most business owners on the very first time, mm-hmm. people will often tell me what they think sounds good. Sure. And then it's like, okay. Thank you for the deflection. Sure. Now let's, what do you really want to do? Yeah. And I, we want to come to the table, right, with these grandiose ideas, but at the end of the day, it all costs you something. Sure. To get there. We, yeah. we see these movies, you know, like Braveheart and, mm-hmm. you know, where people, you know, he sacrificed. Think about what did it take? I, I think when I think mental strength and mental toughness, I think about those 
that are able to sacrifice beyond measure, to forgive the unfathomable and still stand and still wash their enemy's feet. That's a strength that you cannot, words cannot describe what pain did it take to bring that person so that it cost them something. And I think a lot of times people do not weigh those costs out and what happens is they either they either rise to the occasion or they mm. crumble and they become rubble. Yeah. And I think that a lot of times our mental illness is really just a lack. I don't want to get into, you know, chemicals and all of this. Sure. I don't want to get into that, okay? But what I do want to say in that is that I think that a lot of times um we work a lot with, we've got a lot of individuals in our personal life that have mental illness that are, you know, being treated and stuff. Um, so I feel like I've got a foot at least on that playground. So I feel like I can say something. I think that instead of telling somebody what they can and cannot do, we should tell them what they can do. Yeah. And we allow those words, but it all comes from a different place. Mm. And it comes from a place in the heart where We are, you know, we've talked before at how, you know, organs hold memories. Yeah. And it's fascinating, right, whenever they do an organ transplant because it is not uncommon. Sure. It used to be, you know, in the beginning they used to go, ooh, taboo, taboo. (laughs) Now it's like, oh, um, you got, you know, you got Reggie up in there. What's, you know, now you like spicy food and stuff. So uh, that's kind of fun Uh, because you change because now Reggie's a part of you. And you're engrafted in a sense, and he's engrafted into you. And how fascinating to think about that. Mm -hmm. And that isn't it out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. We believe things about ourselves that others have spoken out of the belief we've allowed to nestle in our hearts. One of the things that, that I... And we're talking about this in many different ways, but I want to I want to yes. really make it really poignant. When we go through all of these these adversities, when we go through somebody that's got like chemical stuff, and and they they really feel like they're at their their end, what we want to, them to get to the place of is fearlessness. And yeah. and it's really fascinating because you know here we have the Bible that says fear not three hundred sixty five times, and it, and it's true, but we don't realize that everything we're doing is literally moving us towards this fearlessness. And if if fear is definitely the opposite of love, when finally we hit fearlessness, now we do have this love, like this forgiveness you talk about, being able to effortlessly do that and being able to accept oneself, being able to to do all these things that people would look at and say, how did you manage? How did you be selfless? And and it really takes that getting to the end of yourself, which is end of end of fear. And I can remember a couple of different experiences that that hit there. And I can remember on New Year's Eve of 2010, feeling like the weight of the world was crushing me. And, and that almost abject terror that was going on at that point in my life. And it, it literally breaks you because you just think, I cannot handle anymore. And once it happens, I remember it, it's so unbelievable and yet believable and awesome and a gift that there's people put in front of you at a specific time to say something. Now, I'm going to say the phrase, but it probably means nothing to some people, but some people are like, oh my gosh, I need to hear that. And we were talking, I was talking with a client and they say, what are they going to do? Take your birthday? (laughs) And I was like- Okay, I love that. That's just funny. I know. And it was was so like out there that I was like- (laughs) It just stunned me sure. and stopped me. Yes. And I was like, at that point, I was, I, I remember crossing my arms in front of me and thinking about it. And I was like, no crap. Of course. What could they possibly do to me? And, and that was a breaking point that all of a sudden this, and this is now 10 years into discovering that I was really the culprit in everything. And now Moving through three years of constant trying to let go of negativity and then moving in at about age 33 to now, I, I don't have any more bad days because I get to decide them. Sure. But, 
But to get to the point where I was in this kind of a situation, it wasn't a bad day. It was just tremendous pressure and fear. It, I guess we could have called that much fear and terror a bad day, but I never saw it that way anymore. It was more so what the, the fear of the unknown or what was going to happen. And then when you, when it breaks, all of a sudden you're like, you know what? I'm actually good no matter what. And then we now have this, this massive leap forward where no more fear touches you. And if it comes near me, it's so like not supposed to be. It's like, it's like you're looking at a, a black and white picture and then there's a red rose. What doesn't belong here? Right. It becomes very obvious that when fear enters any part of my psyche, that's like, what are you doing? And why are you here? And all eyes and guns turn to that thought. And now it's like, oh, I was just trying to maybe see if I could exert over you some control again. No, thank you. I don't want anything that you have to sell me these days. And so fear becomes something that that begins to break it. And, and we could say that there's people out there that call it the good doorman or door woman principle that you're only going to allow certain things into your mind, but it's, it's exploring your mind and getting to the point where you can actually decide yes or no, I don't, I do, or I don't want that anymore. And so when you finally say no to fear and you don't accept that anymore, there's this tremendous power that comes in because now all of a sudden love rush, rushes in and it's the only thing that has power the only thing that really extends forever and ever, and you realize, why did everybody try to hide this from me? Who, why does the world believe that love is weak and love is you know, nothing and fear and anger and, and, and hatred is, is way, way more powerful? And so as, as I got to that point, then all of a sudden it became easy to simply express my feelings and my thoughts and ideas without fear of what another person thought. It's what we would eventually get to is that point of authenticity that we've sure. always wanted. And so as, as we go down this, this pathway leading to mental strength, we're going through all of these little epiphanies till all of a sudden we have something large, which I think faith or fearlessness is, is so vitally important. You want to touch or add some things there? I would love to. I was, as you were speaking, you know, there's mm -hmm. several things that were going across from my, because I agreed with everything you had to say. I think that um, it cost, there's a journey. Mm -hmm. um, I love um, Mandela. Mm -hmm. And why? Because even after prison, yeah, even after his daughter and his wife never came to him, and though we called and called and called, he stayed. I I just and continued to love, right? Yeah. And call forth them that never came. Sure. And so I think of the sacrifice and what did it cost him? Yeah. Um and I think that as people it's easy for us to do that, but there's always a process of what does that really look like? And if somebody's really struggling and saying, okay, I really want to do this, one of the very first things I think is important is owning your piece and your part. Yes. You know, not just saying, okay, yeah, and gliding over it, but saying, okay, this is my stuff. I made these decisions and I allowed this and this and this to happen. Now I got to sure. reach right on out there and forgive myself. And what did it cost you? And what did it cost me? The cost is high. It, the cost is exceptionally high. It, the cost for me, what to, in my eyes is was and I should say was because I'm on the other side was exceptionally high. And if somebody was to give it, tell me the price tag, when I said yes, I'm not so sure I would have agreed to it. Mm -hmm. um, and I love, I love looking at costs in terms of the tangibles and intangibles. The, the intangibles are stuff we don't think about because I tell people the cost of, of continuing to doing what you're doing is, is peace. At, at the expense of, of peace, you're going to have to go towards fear. At the expense of love, giving up love, you're going to have to go towards fear. So as you go towards fear, your cost is immeasurable because these are the only things of value. And so as, as we get those things, like Mandela, you know, he realized the cost. He was going to pursue and continue to do what he did because he knew that 
love was the only way to succeed and and to and to do that in a, in a massive way. And I think of Gandhi the same way as yes. as he went through his prison experience. And many people out there, maybe they're in prison right now. It's not a physical prison, but they are definitely in a mental one. They are in a self-imposed one. Yes, Good. Sir. And so the cost is astronomical. Mm-hmm. Basically, living freely and authentically and being okay with you is is the cost when you accept the artificial or the fake as I am not good enough, I'm garbage, I'm crap, I'm a mistake, I'm all these things that we call ourselves. I am not enough. I am I am miserable. I should have been better than this. I should have had this, that, or the other thing. If we go to the tangible things, I should have had a better house, a better spouse, a better bank account, whatever. And and at the expense of peace and joy and love, we have these artifices that once you let them go, you're like, why didn't I do that sooner? And so the people that have gone through the prisons that have literally done it in a physical sense and then realized the mental that followed, man, I could be free mentally and physically, yes. even within a prison box. Yes. Physically, I am actually free. And so that becomes the highest state or goal of anyone is that whatever their situation looks like in their life, that that no longer defines them at all. And so we have these, these well-meaning people that talk about, don't be defined by your whatever circumstances. I want them to see it in a very real sense so that they can start having that decision process and make it consciously. Hey, I get it now. I, I see it on a, on a deeper level. If I am afraid right now, or if I'm in a bad place, I am selling my peace. I'm selling my, my love. I'm selling my joy. And I'm buying garbage and I'm allowing it to stay in my mind. And so that door woman, door man principle or that fearlessness literally has the courage to say, no more. I'm going to go somewhere completely different. Thoughts, comments on that? You know, I go back to um, when I was at uh, Lake Taps, a family member was closing with me one night and um, had raped me. And years later, right, because we're told to shut up, sit down. Sure. And don't talk about that. Don't talk about it. Yeah. Um, he broke into my to my home uh to rape me again while my dad was out hunting and he was actually my mom my mom had actually woke up and threw him out of the house, was confused why he was there, didn't understand, and because I never said anything, because after all, you don't talk about things like that. Sure. Right. So years later, while you were talking, I'm thinking about, I did, I never allowed that moment to define me. Mm. I never said, Candace, it's your fault. And I didn't see, I equate that to mental toughness prior to the rape ever happening. Sure. That though you defiled my body for the moment, you won't have my mind nor my heart. Correct. And so I think, though, for a lot of victims, it's easy to sit down, shut up, and hold on. Because yeah. after all, the easy job, the easy way, <clears throat> excuse me, is to get, keep your mouth shut. Sure. The hard one is opening up. Yeah. So I chose the easy way for years mm. until I allowed it to not define me. And I just tucked it away. But I really believe in different conversations. People Mm -hmm. allow that to define their whole life. Yeah. And I think that bad things happen to beautiful, beautiful, glorious people. Yeah. And what you do with those tragedies, what you do when those thoughts come that you're the cause, you know, it was your fault after all, all of this shame, what happens? What different decisions do you make to empower you that you don't live from an aspect of fear? One of the exercises that we ask our clients to do is to actually become conscious of how many times does fear enter their thoughts in a day. Yeah. And I make them do hash marks. I don't need to know what they are, sure. but I want I we're just bringing light to a blind spot because we all have them. 
And that's just the ones they're catching. That's just, the, that's it. That's not the subconscious one. So, <laughs> you know, that's a whole nother thing. Troy, I think one of the best things that happens to us really is that we are made for struggle. And we need to realize that early in life, mm-hmm. not later in life. Um, as you know, I've struggled with health issues mm-hmm. that nobody for years and years and years, nobody would answer, nor could they. Yeah. Um, and then especially, it's kind of like the crescendo, I think. Um, when you're told you're going to die so many times, yeah. of course, you know, wh- the first thing, I think they're kidding. I think they're, I mean, it's like, what? I, You know, I've suffered from kidney stones. That's That's common knowledge. And of course, you know, I'm back again with 103 fever and, you know, they think they've got it this time. And I'm thinking, okay, well, of course you've got it. It's a kidney stone. Where's it going to go? <laughs> and I mean, instantly, yes. right, that's your response. But all of a sudden, I literally have something like 16 bags of antibiotics and I'm near death's door again. When I got COVID, 103 fever for two weeks, packing ice around my head. I keep thinking, am I going to die? And all I can help, all that I can hear is this is not unto death. And I hung on to it because that's not a voice of a stranger. Sure. So when I went to the hospital, these are all aspects of being mentally tough. Hmm. Do you give in? Because it's easy to give in to fear. Oh, yeah. Fear is easy. It's hard to stand. The path of least resistance. So while I'm locked up away, you know, with nobody, when the doctors come in again Mm -hmm. and they say, you're almost dead, Candace, and we want to incubate you or innovate you or whatever Mm -hmm. it is. And I, because you're, again, on the bubble of death's door, when... You're the only voice in the room. And these people, with all of their professional arrogance, they just do them. They are magnificent in their own right. So I, I give I give credit where credit is due. Sure. And they're saying, mm-hmm. you know, you better make those phone calls. And I know that this is not unto death. So again, we stand and we say, okay. And I heard what they said, but you see, I know something different. Yeah. How do you stand? Well, you stand. I t- asked the uh, the team that had come out, the, the pulmonologist team that had come out. Um, first of all, I was way too happy. according, And, th- and they did say, your uh, disposition is much more brighter than your medical records show. <laughs> well, you I think don't that's, say. I yeah. think that's hilarious, right? Yeah. Because... They kept asking me my name. And I said, that's me. Are, are you, how are you doing? I said, I'm doing phenomenal. How are you? Not, well, we're not in the hospital, Candace. They went back and then the lead of pulmonology came down because obviously I'm delusional. I'm just way too happy. And they're not quite sure what they have on their hands. Sure. Okay. We're going to choose joy. Yeah. I'm not going to get scared because we've been at death's door so many times now. It's like, bring it on. Yeah. Oh, hello, Mr. Death. I've met you before. You just got to move on because this is not into death for me. Sure. And and ultimately, it, so many people, if, if they're not catching this, when when you don't live in the past, because if you live in the past, then that's where you're going to stay. and You're going to be miserable in that thought. But when you release the past, now you can actually move into somewhere brand new and it's called the present moment which is where things happen. And that's the only place we're going to be truly happy or joyful. And so even though they say death, it's like, look, that's, that's a future in, you know, possibility, but I'm not going to let that be the actuality. I'm going to simply be right here right now. And I have clients that have come in that are just on death's door and they're, they're, they literally tell me they're on hold. Their life is on hold. I'm like, for what? Why? (laughs) <laughs> well, because it's so bad. I'm like, what's so bad? You're right here in a room with me right now, just talking, present. If you keep going to an uncertain future, you're going to be miserable. So you yes. need to live right now because it's the only place to now. And I love that aspect of stand yes. because you can't stand in the past. Mm-hmm. You can't stand in the future. You can only stand right now. That's and it. so as you stand right now in that present moment, 
you now release all those other things and say, you know what, if, if tomorrow's my last day, then tomorrow's my last day. But right now I'm, I'm going to be present. I'm going to be joyful. I'm going to be happy because that'd just be, that'd be selling my happiness that's right. for misery. And that's too high of a price for me. Yes. I'm not going to do that. So those people that have bad things like your story of being raped, those people that have those kinds of things that they continue to live in that past, we would definitely invite them into this present moment. And it may seem difficult. They're like, I can't do that. Well, you actually won't do that. And that's the bigger thing. But what if, what if we said, could you? Now I didn't say do it. I just asked you, could you, Mm -hmm. could you let go? Uh, Well, maybe. Great, that's all I need. I'm not asking you to let go. I'm just saying, could you? Could it be? I can't. Well, we'll get there. Possibly at some point, maybe, could it be a consideration that you could? You know, I'll back up. Maybe. Got it. Well, that's at least a toe in the door. And so as we, as we inch towards blowing this door wide open and walking out into freedom and leaving behind this past that we're, we're continually living that's only making us miserable, and I, I know many clients that would not make that transition. They saw me a couple times, they were gone. Yes. Ah, I was, I was infiltrating their identity and they didn't like it. They wanted to stay miserable. What, is it, what does it give them Indeed. to hold on? That is when, the question. When you hold on, you're not, you, you, you may not receive anything else, mm-hmm. no matter what your belief system is. Sure. If, if your pot is full... It cannot, <laughs> even though it runneth over, you can need another pot and then another pot. You yeah. can't add to it. Mm-mm. And I think, I think that self-robbery yeah. um, is one of the, I'll be honest, I think self-robbery is one of the most saddest, most horrible state of the human heart. And it is rampant. It is rampant because... With those with those issues mm-hmm. comes a line of disengagement. Mm-hmm. It it comes with a the cost of holding on causes your conscience to be seared. Yeah. And your sight really to be dim. Mm. And though you say you were clothed, you were really naked. Yeah. Because on all levels you want because the bitterness is in it's palatable. I I have felt bitterness that's more than palatable with clients, yeah. and it's been. And I want to dive in. I want to say, talk to me about that. I I don't care about the business is one thing, but sure. we're not ever going to get you beyond today unless we talk to you. You charge that circuit, man. It's it's powerful. It's like yes. you can feel the heat coming. You can. Yeah. And, and ultimately, you know, one of the last concepts that I think we would explore is this idea of, we hear this concept, practice makes perfect, but perfect practice makes perfect. And I can practice negativity until I am positively, perfectly negative and reactive and unhappy and miserable. And, and so mind whatever you're doing right now, because you are indeed practicing out there. You are all the time you are do you have i have affirmations Mm -hmm. that i hang on to and would you share some of yours and i'll share some of mine and hopefully it might lift some hearts out there i i love simplicity yes and sometimes simplicity can be confusing because like i don't get it because one of my favorites is the truth is always true yes and people are like Uh, that's kind of meaningless. That should be on a t-shirt too. Should be. (laughs) And so, but we don't realize that the, the beautiful thing about the truth is you never have to defend it. It is true. That's right. But a lie must always be defended. That's a great point. Yeah. It always feels lacking. It always feels limited where truth is completely expanded and that's rare you know, in our day. And so I say it because even though it is kind of out there and up there, it, it's still drawing. And so for, for where you are out there, that may be too much. Well, that, that's not my affirmation and that's okay. Your affirmation might be something more simple. Like I love, I used to say all the time, love never stops loving. That's right. Because if it's real love, it stays love. It doesn't turn to hate. Nope. Doesn't turn to animosity. Doesn't turn to, to fear. It love never stops loving. 
and be thankful that it doesn't. So those are a couple of mine. I have many more. Go ahead. Shoot. Um, I already know. First of all, if I, if I got a busy day, Mm -hmm. then I will meditate and I strongly believe because I have put this one to the test so many times that I just step out on that limb at any moment now because it's gone from practicing, right? Because yeah. we're not practicing, right? Because now we've perfected because we made that decision. Can I go back in one thing Yeah. that I really want to share? And that is with mental toughness. Mm-hmm. It is a decision, Troy, the bottom line. Absolutely. After we have all these different aspects and all of them are correct because they feed into everybody's story because it's sure. part of our story. And we're talking to humans and we're all human and we're all having this experience together. Yeah. But at the end of the day, you chose what shirt to put on. Was it hard for you to decide what shirt? Not in the least. Okay. Was it hard for you to decide what shoes or socks? Nope. Simple. Those are easy decisions. Correct. But we make other things, right? And we hang on to things because there's emotions involved. But at the end of the day, my friend, it's only a decision. That's true. And we put whatever weight, whatever, whatever, we put whatever is attached to that decision on the table Yeah, when it shouldn't be. And it makes me think of, of, of one of my affirmations. I'll tell people all the time, you, you make, or you, excuse me, you, you give everything all the meaning it has to you. So yeah. whatever it is, you've already decided. So if I hand you a peanut butter sandwich, you're going to decide what that means to you. Exactly. If I hand you a hundred dollar bill, you're going to do whatever you want with that. And you're going to give everything. So if you see some guy that looks like an ex or some gal that looks like an ex and you all of a sudden have a bad day, you give everything all the meaning it has to you. How many times have we spoken to our friends, our colleagues, whomever, and the very first thing, oh, my alarm clock didn't go off. My sure. whole day is ruined. Good Lord. There's 24 hours. That was just 15, 20 minutes. Yeah. Ooh, maybe you needed that extra hour. Instead of doing it, let's just spin it around. You know, this is not, you know, wink, wink, as serious as it is. I'm playing. Sure. But, you know, it's not the Israeli peace treaty. Nobody's getting their eyes poked out. Now that place is stressful. Yeah. Please just breathe, right? One of my affirmations, Troy, that I go to all the time, and that is, First and foremost, I lack not one thing. In this moment, this is absolutely complete. I have no need of water. I have no need of anything. Lie, um, facility, everything is complete. Yes. I am born and made for struggle. If I wasn't, I wouldn't have made it this long. Sure. And I figure I've got enough strength and struggle that I'll make it the rest of the way. Mm -hmm. I think that when we short give our when we short change us, we decide. Yeah, I have a a short story. Friends of ours um, is very very interesting. Their dad had had a major stroke. Yeah, and the doctors um, before they went in to talk to him, they had decided uh, that they wanted the doctors to talk to the family first. Mm -hmm. And so what happened was the doctor said, he's going to die. The stroke is damaged. It's blah, blah, blah. Horrible, horrible news. Sure. And his wife, um, she looked at that doctor and she said, now you've told us your truth. Now, when you walk in there, you will tell my husband that he is going to make a 110% recovery and he will speak And he'll be able to eat his food and walk out this door. And that's the only thing you're going to tell him until I tell you otherwise. Yeah. Now, the test result. Now, this was so cool because the doctor was angry. All right. Sure. He felt like he was lying, which that was a whole nother discussion. Okay. Correct. He went in and he did tell him that you will make a full recovery. You know, that the test results look favorable and that they're going to do everything that they could to get him and to walk out that door. Yeah. Now she would not allow anyone, anyone, if you did not, if you weren't part of that program, you'd see, you just didn't go in the room, my friend. Yeah. So 
Some nurses wouldn't go in the room, and she said, not a problem. I'll hire somebody else to make sure he's okay. Correct. At the end of the day, in three months, now listen, it wasn't perfect, nor was it pretty. Yeah. But by golly, he got out of that bed, and he walked out that door. Yeah. Thought. Now, he did, he did suffer major strokes, and he did pass away a year later. The whole point was that he was delivered the fact that he was going to walk out the door. The doctors, the doctors said you weren't. Sure. We do not understand. And I don't, I don't believe even though we have science and everything at the power. I don't think we, we, we understand the depth nor the power of our mind yeah. that he said what was going to happen. He told that man that by test results, mm-hmm. by all sense and purposes, they were really preparing for his death. That's why he had all those family members up in the house. Sure. But there was one voice that stood and said, no, not not today, sir. Speaking truth. Into- Speaking truth. Yeah. So, Troy, sometimes I wonder, when we're given different options, mm-hmm. and if I can hit on a nerve that might be out there, I don't know, for those that are that of a spiritual nature. I don't believe in healing lines because Jesus didn't heal them all. Yeah. And I think that what we do when we set people up in healing lines is that we really, they ignite their faith mm-hmm. and what happens when they're not healed. But we never stop to say, father, is Troy going to be healed? Is Bobby going to be healed? Is this what you want? Sure. Father, because I do believe in supernatural healings because I've seen them. And it all had to do with the will of the Father. He's sovereign. Right. And he doesn't make sense to us at times. And yeah. he probably should not make sense to us since the Holy Spirit is still searching the very depths of God and cannot find the end. <laughs> well, and, and ultimately, we should not be in charge of miracles anyways because we'd be no. poor, poor you know, keepers of that. And as we do that, like you say, putting them and ask... Who should be healed? Who should I go talk to? Who do you say that is next? Jesus. Yeah. Remember when he walked up to in the pool, to mm-hmm. the pool, and he asked them, this is so riveting to me, because yeah. he asked him, do you want to be healed? Do you yeah. want to be made well, depending upon your different translation? Sure. And immediately, I think it's so like each of us. He immediately starts, ah, and he starts giving out all these excuses Jesus. on why he, can't, he isn't healed today. His story. That's right. There's his story. And it's so funny because I so see all of us, right? Yeah. We're going to immediately explain the situation. Yeah. And, you know, of course, I'm paraphrasing, but, you know, it's kind of like, Brother Matt, I didn't ask you. Mm. What? Why? I just said... You can almost hear the shame coming from him. Yes. Like, I don't know why I haven't been healed in 30 That's years. Right. I guess I'm not worthy, and I don't know what to do. Nobody pushes me in the pool. That's right. And the, so all the these guilt, fears. I can't get up and run. Yeah. And, ha, 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 and, and then it's like, I'm sorry, you didn't hear the question. Do you want? Because I'm willing, the Father's willing to heal you, but please understand your whole life will change because all of a sudden you see you can't be laying here anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and he will not violate your will, so That's I've got right. to ask you. Yeah. <laughs> That's so true. Yes. And so I find that story to be incredibly compelling yeah. to our human nature in so many areas. So there's that thought process, right? It's really good. I'm the victim. And so, you know, I want to I wrap up kind of what we've done today because sure. we've covered a lot of bases. And, and we've gone through kind of the beginning struggles, the experience. We've gone through the awareness process. We've gone through um, even taking thoughts captive and seeing the lie and the truth clear. And then all of a sudden having this door woman, doorman principle. Um, and then the sustainability of all of it, which is just the practice in our life and, and practicing perfectly and understanding what is a value and what isn't a value, and then allowing that to continue to change and enhance us in many ways. And so mental, mental toughness, strengthening one's mental ability, it, we can think that it's just positive affirmations, but it isn't. It is well beyond anything like that. And it, it does take everything that goes on in your life and appreciating each each aspect of it and honoring each aspect of it. Yes. Very and it's so. okay that, a, you know, adversity comes because adversity is what makes us who we are. If, if, 
if in essence, building character, like we had a brief little oh, conversation yes. about character a little bit, and that your character is always built by everything you do. It just may not be in the way that you would like it. So will you make a decision there and say, my character will be built in a different way? All this is part of that mental toughness. You know, that's so true. In business, I think I, whomever, mm. I didn't say who, whom, whomever comes to start that business, you know, Troy, it, you are who you are and you bring that. Yes. And it's so important because businesses, um, change people's lives. I truly believe that that's one mode of, that it impacts people eternally. Mm. And what I mean by that is someone's in pain and they haven't been out of pain in 20 years. Now listen, that pain has made bad decisions. That pain has been cruel. That pain, you know, yep. it's caused arguments guaranteed, right? You've yeah. been short and all of a sudden they get out of pain and it's like, oh, the sky is brighter. The trees are greener, you know? And that's the beauty of what you bring to the yeah. table and the gift of to humanity of whom you are. Yeah. And so the ability to reach beyond really thought or even process, because when you lay your hands on that person, mm. you've come in contact. When you think about it, you've come in contact with the eternal. Yeah. And you're making adjustments to the eternal. Mm, yeah. And so whether that's releasing the energy, whether that's those healing hands, whether um, it's words of wisdom, whatever, every client, they come because you have a banqueting table set for them. That's why even though we might want to see everybody, only those that are called will see true and so i that's what i think the part of the beauty of you and what your team provides to the community mm. is a community yeah individuals that stand in the unseen to be seen to pull from the unseen to be seen on the scene yeah I can't say that again. Sure. <laughs> Don't ask. Okay. But that is yeah. the beauty. When you think about the power of your team, mm. and that is what, I mean, if you look at it, it's what every single chiropractor, right? Every mm. physician, every time you lay hands, massage practitioner, acupuncture, when you lay hands on those people, you touch the eternal. Yeah. It's beautiful because, Troy, you understand that weight and you have the ability to be honorable and trustworthy and respectful. And it's just not another person. And so when they come, you're able to give the most best oranges I've ever eaten in my whole life. <laughs> I have been waiting for years. Now, I have to totally tell on you real quick. And then I'll 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 let you close up, sir. Okay. But this listen, I've waited years for these beautiful, gorgeous, perfect, mind you, perfect oranges that he Troy has talked about for years. And I just happened to be down there on a day when those delicious things were there. And yeah. I I did he gave me one. He was very gracious and it was the best orange I honestly have ever eaten. Yeah. And so it just speaks to your character. Yeah. We have, we're challenged character wise. We're challenged all the time. Yes. Whether to be upright or not. Mm. And it's those little foxes that spoil the vine. <sighs> it's those little decisions. It's never a, the monumental decision, yeah. right? Yeah. It's not the decision when a country decides to go to war. It's sure. the t 10 trillion decisions prior. Before, yeah. It's and that's the way it is for our oh, personal right. life. It's it's not one thing. It's it's that all those decisions. For sure. And so I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart mm -hmm. for allowing me to giving me an opportunity to have a voice and to come and be a part of just the beauty of what you're creating. Thank you. Yes, thanks, Candace. And and again, it, it's honoring the journey that you've been through and and all the the struggle. And watching it now have its, 
I guess it's fruit, and the fruit is good. And and I love I love the analogy because just as a, as a quick aside, Candace has access to figs, and figs are by far my most favorite. And so the ones you bring are just unbelievable. So I'm I'm totally happy to share my oranges <laughs> that I that I'm able to get for you know fresh off the vine that are just amazing. So it's it's an it's a totally even trade in my book. But thank you again for honoring us with your presence too, and everything that you've been through, and and just being you really. And I know that it sounds kind of like cop out, but ultimately it's, it's such a big statement because what you are is what all of us need. And so you're just pointing the way, which I just love. And so thank you. Until next time, thank you for joining us on this journey. I am Dr. Troy. And remember, there is way more right with you than there is wrong with you. Thanks for listening. If you have any questions or comments, you can reach Dr. Munson at 360. 360- 893-8586 or email him at chiroman at dr.com. That's C-H-I-R-O-M-A-N at dr.com. Check out our current workshop schedule on Facebook at Infinity Whole Health.